Yeah, I'm Benjamin Otto. I'm introduce myself as a GNOME guy, whereas I've been working on that project for, I don't know, five years now, doing various stuff on and off. I was the GStreamer co-lead developer until three years ago. So I have a bit of experience doing multimedia work. And two years ago, um, I took up the SwiftTech project, which was uh, at that time a dormant little thumbsing. Yeah, SwiftTech is a free flash player. I got <laughs> I got started uh, doing it because I was looking at a blog post which had an awesome YouTube link and didn't play on my machine. And then it was like, it can't be that hard to make it work. And it turns out making YouTube play wasn't that hard, but making all the other Flash files play took a little longer. In fact, I have no idea how long it will take. I'm not done yet. So after I made YouTube work, um, I thought a while, why should I continue writing a Flash player? I can watch all the important videos now. <laughs> and one of the big reasons why I want to have a free Flash player is because I want Flash to go away. Um, when I was at last Guadic, somebody looked at me and said, I don't understand this. And I explained it to him, which took a while. And uh, he said, you should make a talk out of that and submit it to LCA. And here I am. So the whole idea of why I want Flash to go away is because I want to liberate content. What do I mean when I say content? Content is a... Is a Usually, people talk about content as things they worked on, that they did a hard job to write their software, compose their music, stuff they worked on. Content for me is also stuff that was quickly created, one-time hack that you put somewhere, uh, something where you just made a little sketch, tried to show somebody something and then throw it somewhere and forget about it. Stuff that accidentally comes into existence, which is like maybe an IRC lock or something where you had uh, even a face-to-face -face conversation where you, where, you, where you think afterwards, man, I'd like to remember what that was. And in fact, it's all the things we ever did, which is... Uh, goes up to all the applications that have undo functionality so you can look at what you did yesterday or maybe just 20 seconds ago. So what we basically want to do is to do stuff with the content, but it's not always that easy to get at the content when we want to or even to get at the content we want to. I mean, it's just like I said, when you remember a discussion or try to remember a discussion from, from five minutes ago, you often don't remember exactly what it was that this guy said to you that you, that you keep thinking about. You know roughly what it was, but he said it in one sentence and it was so awesome and now you can't repeat it. So contents gets lost. Um, this is discussions that we forget, but focusing back on computers, um, what do we do with it? Do we put it on the internet? Do we store it locally? Do we, how do we avoid stuff getting lost? It's something I talk long about with lots of people and decided this topic deserves its own talk. So I'll 
Notice it. Note it and skip it. Oh, I should, forgot to mention one thing. If you have questions, just ask them while I'm rambling away here. Um, it's better if we ask them in time than later on. Yes. Um, when I say flash, especially when you hear talk about uh, content, I mean flash files mostly. So the SWF stuff. So content is hard to access sometimes. Um, this, there's multiple reasons for that. One of the biggest reasons is because somebody doesn't want you to access the contents, so they put DRM on it, so you probably can't copy it and only can read it with some devices. Content is sometimes hard to access more or less by accident. This is uh, the case with Flash, where the Flash format is, there's not many many applications that can read in Flash content. So whenever somebody wants to use stuff from Flash, they just uh, take a screenshot of their browser and use the image they have, which is the best they can do. There was actually somebody uh, doing a talk last year said, I want an IBM logo, and I have a Flash file that has an awesome IBM logo, but when I take a screenshot of it, it's only this big. And if I put it on here, it's not really awesome. If I scale it up, it will look pixelated. Yeah, and on the flash file, he could scale it a bit, and it looked always awesome, but he had no chance to get at it. Another thing with uh, content is that it gets outdated. Like, you probably... Like, put VHS tapes here that you might still have at home. I'm not sure if your last VHS player still works. Uh, mine certainly doesn't. So I have a bunch of tapes that I can't look at, but I probably if I wanted to look at it, I would have to bring them somewhere place and pay lots of money. I've listed game demos here because um, games quickly change and when a new version comes around, the new version can play the old demos. And a lot of times you throw away the older versions of the game and then you can't even patch it back. And then you play this awesome game against someone and want to humiliate him and to show the game at some conference or something and no chance. Even the Firefox history these days is quite a lot harder to read than it was a year ago. Firefox stores its history in SQLite format, which means you need SQLite to access it. But Windows users don't have SQLite, and when they look into this file, these files with all the zero bytes and whatever quickly get confused. On the other hand, Firefox can still read it, but how long will they use Firefox? So, now that we know this problem, there's another one. Most of the time we are not aware of these problems. Or better, we don't care. So, I don't know who of you does backups. I don't. So at least some people do backups. Do you know if you can access the tapes still that you do the backups on? <laughs> so you use CDs? Yeah, you, you'll, probably, you'll tr probably make sure you can still access it. But. It's a somewhat hard problem. And I don't do backups. I often get crashes of my hard drives and then everything is gone, but I still haven't learned it. 
probably because I'm way too lazy to think about the problem. The other thing is stuff on the internet. I'm not sure how many people save their blog posts, assuming they upload them to services like LiveJournal, which recently got into trouble and people were wondering if it would go down and then the service went down and luckily they came back up. Awesome. On the other hand, um, I, I talked to a Mozilla guy that said there's probably lots more data that's lost locally than on the internet. So, but as I said, that's a whole different topic. Yeah, th then I put browser history expire days into it because there's actually applications that happily destroy content meaning your browser history gets deleted after I don't know how many days. It's set to by default. I set it to the maximum in integer value and when I did this some years ago, Firefox crashed so I set it to 99,000 days or something. There goes your history. Yeah, it's also who even knows that the history is saved and for how long. I mean, as I said, I'm lazy, I don't even do backups, why should I care what my other applications save? And the next thing is, even if we do care about the form and, about the form and formats and what people say us, um, we want to take special care that our word files can be read by OpenOffice. You probably all know the story about render as Word 95, which is a flag in the OOXML specification that can be set to true, and then some specific parts will be rendered just as in Word 95. Assuming you know what that means. And yeah, as I was writing the presentation, how many tools can actually handle open office presentations? I mean, obviously open office, but how long will I have open office on my computer? Will it be there in 15 years? So if I store this presentation now, will I be able to reopen it then? Oh yeah, and this is my favorite example because a lot of people are um, happy as long as their stuff is free for them. Take the best tool for the job. So, well, I have an NVIDIA graphics card, so I'll make the binary driver. Who cares? Maybe when the next X server comes around, this one will not work. I don't know. Same for Flash. Well, Flash does the job better than anyone else, so I'll take Flash. In five years, when I've finally succeeded in making Flash obsolete, you will sit there with your files and not be able to play them anymore. And then I will laugh at you. Yeah, that's one of the things I already touched. Usually, we are very, very lazy people. At least I am, and when I do software, I usually assume my users are too. Some of them aren't and complain very loudly when I just do stuff, but most of them are. So when I was looking for photos of me as a kid, um, it was not that easy to find some because Nobody thought they would be important and had stored them somewhere. So I had to dig through the cellar, find lots of interesting things and photos of me as a kid, luckily. Whereas my password is actually a very good example of this. Um, password is a 
bit of content that you need to lock into something. And people are so good at forgetting it that um, whenever you have a system that does not have a way set up to recover passwords, you run into all sorts of problems. Kind of shows my point. Then there was this, this big event I had where I realized that the content and the culture that surrounds that content influence themselves. This is the obvious example. I'm not, I don't think I need to say a lot of that. The recording industries that wants to be the sole creator and controller of all the content and the amateurs that just are happy if someone listens to them and hand out all the files they created for anyone else to use and do stuff, what, do stuff with them, whatever they want. But the important thing where I noticed that was HTML versus Flash. And uh, there was this one time when I was writing my Flash player that uh, I needed a way to decompile the codes in the Flash file. Flash file stores everything as interesting byte codes. So if you look at the code, it looks pretty much like some sort of assembler, and you cannot read it. So I thought somebody must have taken the work to write one. And I looked through the internet. And I found a lot of forum posts where some people had asked the same thing. Most of them had asked, hey, I just found an old flash file I had written, but I have lost the sources to this flash file. Can I get them back? And in those cases, people said, no, you didn't. What you did was download a flash file and, want to, and you want to hack it. And you only want the sources for that so you can steal other people's code. Um, and this is when I realized that there's a huge difference between uh, the HTML web people and the Flash web people. The Flash web people assume you want to steal their stuff. Because if you ask in an HTML thing, I remember this from when Google Mail came out, people just go, wow, that's awesome. How did Google do that? And everybody else said, well, there's a view source key. Look how they did this. And the same thing happened again with Google Suggest. You know, this thing where you type in the first part of your search and it just starts suggesting how you want to finish it. Wow, that's so fast. How did they do it? Well, look at the source. If somebody does something awesome in Flash, everybody goes, well, they're good, but we have no chance to ever figure out how they did this. And this is due to the format. The flash format, nobody can read. It takes a lot of time to look at those bytes and decode them and to convert them into something that is almost identifiable to someone that writes a flash player. Whereas in the HTML world, you have a menu entry that tells you, look, this is how we make this awesome. Another thing that I'm a bit involved with is the type people store code. The P star there is PHP, Python, Perl, whatever you have there, which is languages that store their source code on the production systems instead of some byte codes, assembler codes, or whatever. Um, the interesting thing I, I figured out about that is that lots of companies are very attracted to bytecodes because then they assume, oh, my code is hidden. Nobody knows what things I did, what source code I wrote. Nobody can steal it. And uh, the PHP, Python, whatever people just go, well, here's the source code. We'll just install the source code and compile it on time. Then everybody can fix bugs while the system runs. and send us the fixes and 
it's, it's a nice change. Also, um, you'll notice that the, the .NET and Java people, Microsoft and Sun in particular, um, tend to focus on the bytecode. They tell you how many different types of languages you can run on their bytecodes and how awesome these different languages are, while uh, the Python people, well, the Python inter interpreter only runs Python. But they focus on making the source code better. So they tell you, well, now you can do this with our source code and now you can do that, while the bytecode people tell you, well, you can run Python on it, so you can do it too, but our bytecode just got much more awesome. So. How does Parrot fit into this theory, given that Parrot is going to run Perl and Python and the other language? Well, Parrot, just like uh, the implementations of JavaScript, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole how this stuff works is pretty much the same. The question just is, which part do you ship? So uh, the .NET Java people ship bytecode. The JavaScript, Python, Perl, whoever people ship source code. I'm not saying that anything of that is better, but it just tells you that the culture of these communities, in one case, is focused on the bytecode, and the other is focused on the source code. So one of those communities tries to make the source code more readable and compile times faster and stuff like that, while the other makes the bytecode better. So they want to have a great, awesome bytecodes, and this bytecode can support this many different languages and stuff like that. It's not really a better or worse thing in this that I want to point out, but a difference. I actually have an opinion on what is better, but it's not what I wanted to point out here. Go Python. Um, and the obvious example that I probably shouldn't say anything or people will start flaming me. So put only one point here, but um, there's a very different focus on, on the, in the communities, in the GPL and the BSD communities and how they do stuff and how they think. It should be that. Well, I'm quick. Or you ask two little questions. I don't know. Um, the lessons I learned from this. The first thing uh, I learned from this is that developers, when they decide about data formats they want to use for whatever, think way too little about these formats. A lot of time, when they think about the formats, they only think about is this easy to implement? Is this easy to transmit on the internet? Does it take too much storage space? Something like that. Um, an example of this is, uh, for example, uh, the GCon format. I don't know if you ever wanted to, to change a setting in GCONF and uh, figure it out that, well, it's XML, which is awesome, but if you try in this a m huge amount of XML files to actually find the entry and change it in a way that does not confuse the gconf daemon, then you're very lucky. Luckily, there's a tool for this, but this tool only allows you to change settings. So if you want to cop it to write a tool that imports settings from somewhere else, an easy shell script will not do it. You probably want to link to libgconf. Be happy when it's still installed. Um, another example where I often see people show up and uh, be a bit unhappy about the situation is the rhythm box 
format, which again is some XML format, but it's not easy to access. So when people write another music player and want to have an importer for the Rhythmbox library, they usually give up. Which is because everybody thought, well, I'll just make it easy for me and write a little tool that saves all the stuff I have into a file, and then they're happy. Which is probably going back to the point I made earlier that they, the developers were as lazy as I am as a user, but if you can, think about the format. And if you store things that people might find important later on, um, make sure you save them, you, you save it in a way um, that they can read it when your tool no longer exists on their computer or even on the internet. Which is the a big di big problem with Flash again because Flash has these Flash authoring files called FLA, which can only be opened by their authoring tools and the compiled files, which are the SWF files. Lots of people, particularly those ones that need a decompiler, uh, create an SWF file, upload it to the internet, and then forget about the stuff, then their hard disk goes away, and some years later, in, it, in their nostalgia times, they find their old game and want to know what they did there, and then they can't get at it anymore. So yeah, if you're a developer and you have some config files or save files or whatever, think about how you store it because you might be the one that wants to read the data back in in 20 years. The other thing is um, the right community uses the right format. This goes two ways. If you look for a community that fits you and for people that have the same goals as you, you can actually look at the format. If you're one of those people that, want that, that think they have so great ideas that nobody should steal them, then it's easy to look at a format that nobody, could, that nobody can steal and then go to these communities. Um, and of course, when people come from a certain community, they will tend to use certain formats. Like Sun is a company, Sun wants to attract other companies, so they would not encourage use of a format that transmits source code to all their users. So they pretty much obviously would want to take a format that does save bytecode. Yeah. And this is the thing I figured out recently. If in doubt, fix the future. That means if you have the option um, of staying with a format with a format that is broken or making a format yeah let's say it this way first if you if in doubt fix the future if you have a format right now that is broken and you're wondering if you should keep using it because all your current data uses this format already you will only create more stuff in a broken format so better switch now to something better than in five years and have five years more of lost data. It also means for me as a Swift tech or Flash player developer, I should focus on making sure that people that create content now don't use Flash. And this is more important than what I'm trying to do. This is making a Flash player uh, so I can play back all the old files and make all the old files usable. Yeah, which is the 
great goal of my Flash player to come back to the beginning. I'm writing a Flash player or a Flash library so that anyone can go at it, rip content out of SWF files and use it, especially of their own old SWF files. Yeah, and with this most recent discovery, Fix the Future, I'm going to close this talk and say thank you. <laughs> yes? So, uh, I, uh, as I've been thinking about a lot of these similar things for a long time, and I'm, I'm fairly optimistic because it seems that we have some signs of things we can use instead of Flash. For starters, the new HTML5 um, video tag is going to support uh, Fiora and maybe Vera and stuff like that, so a video format that we can use other than Flash video to get support video playback. And we're looking at maybe getting SMIL support and maybe um, PNG with animation, so it looks like we might be able to. I can tell you one thing. You cannot use any tools to convert Flash into anything. Flash has so many side effects in the stuff that it does that it's very hard to convert anything. You can do uh, any for, uh, if you do any thought to convert a specific Flash file into an HTML file, then our tools can certainly help you, but it will never work automatically. Right. Yes, that is. I'm. I'm. I must say, I'm also pretty optimistic these days that uh, the browser vendors, in well, all of the browser vendors apart from uh, Microsoft, who push Silverlight, so what might have something to do with it. By the way, Silverlight uses bytecodes, not source code. Why that? Um, um, are aware, those are aware of the problems and are working on it. There is still quite a way to go from my point of view as a Flash Player developer. The Flash Player can do quite a lot of things that browsers cannot yet do. But I'm optimistic that in two years' time, all the video sites will provide their content in non-Flash formats. Yes. <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Right. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the Firefox history format as being an example of what not to do. I, I, if you're going to choose a binary format, choosing Silverlight seems like a great idea at this point in time. Yes. Um, I, I mentioned the, the Firefox format specifically um, to make you think about it. I, I'm not, I don't know, the, the old format certainly wasn't great. It, it was a format that you could read in a text editor but that you would and never have had any chance to write properly. Yes, I know, it, it, w it was not funny. Right, SQLite is, 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 is not a problem currently, and I think SQLite is a pretty good choice considering how many people use it, which, which is another thing that is uh, interesting, uh, or interesting if you choose a format. It seems like a good idea to choose a format that everybody uses. So if you store images, store them as PNG or JPEG files, and uh, if you store any other data, better store them as text, because if you store them as text, you can read it in your text editor. If you store them as something binary like Flash does, it's a hard time to figure this out. I mean, as long as there are specifications as there luckily are there for Flash now, you at least get to know what all those bits mean, even though it's still a hard thing to interpret it right. Which is... Uh, one of the problems that you have with OpenOffice too, that it's a 
big runtime, which is put around a uh, file format. But at least this file format is XML, so even if you don't have OpenOffice anymore in 20 years and come around this presentation, you can probably still read the text. Anybody else? Right, which is another great thing about text formats. Uh, well, it's not, it's, uh, I'm not going to say great thing, but I think it's a good thing is that if you have a text format, you can choose from plenty of tools to create your own version that writes or reads those text formats, which uh, is something like the GConf problem, because the GConf, is very picky about what XML there is. Even though you can read the XML file easily and write back an XML file, it might still not work. So yeah, having, having these plain text things like HTTP is a very good thing in particular if they, are, if they work with Aronis input that you will probably provide to them the first time you try. Then one more, then I say thank you.